August 10th, 2020. For those across central and eastern Iowa and northern Illinois, it started out like any other morning in summer. Temperatures were in the 70s to 80s, and dew points were in the 70s, with warmer temperatures expected in the afternoon. The thought of severe storms was not on the public's mind. However, those in the Midwest would be getting a severe storm complex that they could never forget even if they wanted to. A once in a decade type event that became the costliest severe thunderstorm event in United States history. The event in question was the August 2020 Midwest derecho. On August 10th, 2020, a derecho originating from a thunderstorm complex on the South Dakota-Nebraska border swept across the Midwestern United States bringing its fury to those in its path. Winds of 60 to 80 miles per hour lashed out across Illinois, Wisconsin, Indiana, and Michigan, but the highest winds and the worst impacts were observed in Iowa. Most of the state saw winds in excess of 70 miles per hour, but from Benton County towards Lynn County, wind gusts from 130 to 140 miles per hour battered the Hawkeye State. The results were catastrophic. Locals described the derecho as a 40-mile-wide tornado, or a hurricane. Damage was everywhere. Power was out for weeks. It was like nothing the state of Iowa had ever seen up to that point. The response was frustrating. Little to no action was taken by the government until three days after the fact in areas such as Cedar Rapids due to no communication between various levels of government. Yet, despite the crisis unfolding in Cedar Rapids and other areas in Iowa, the mainstream media was absent. It's been three years since the 2020 derecho, so today I will be giving a brief review of the different types of derechos, then a look at the synopsis, the events as they happened, the aftermath with a specific focus on the Cedar Rapids area, the response from the government and charitable organizations, the criticism of said response, and the historical significance of the event. Welcome to Nature's Fury. Before jumping into the synopsis, I would first like to cover the differences between a serial and progressive derecho once more to give people a refresher. A serial derecho is a derecho that is associated with a strong surface and upper level system that is dominated by advection, the downstream movement of individual thunderstorm cells by the environmental winds, and they travel parallel to the mean wind direction. Examples of such would be the derecho produced by the Storm of the Century in 1993, and the December 15th, 2021 derecho. Progressive derechos form in relatively benign environments, with no strong surface or upper level systems driving the storms. They thrive in environments with high instability and decent to high mid-level flow. Low-level shear is low, which is for the benefit of the derecho itself, as high-low-level shear can prevent upscale growth. Progressive derechos are dominated by thunderstorm propagation, the development of new storm cells downstream from existing ones. I just recently covered a progressive derecho, specifically the June 29, 2012 derecho, which I will link that video in the description. I also said in that video that they form along stalled frontal boundaries, but put an asterisk on that one because that is not always the case. Reason I say that is, well, you'll see it whenever we get to the synopsis. But the primary difference is that progressive derechos move perpendicular to the mean wind direction. Just take a note though that some of the things that I mentioned during the 2012 derecho video are about to be thrown out the window, as the August 2020 Midwest derecho is a lot more complicated synoptically, even for progressive derechos. But real quick, most people who like these videos are not subscribed to the channel, so if you enjoy my content, please consider subscribing. It helps the channel and tells me I'm doing something right. Anyways, back to the 2020 derecho. On August 10th, in the upper levels of the atmosphere, a dominant ridge of high pressure was located over the southern United States, with a strong trough located in Canada. The trough was pushing southward, and within the trough, was an embedded shortwave that dug into portions of Iowa during the morning and afternoon. So what did it look like on the surface? Well, the cold front was already over western Iowa and into Nebraska, ahead of where the storms were. 
this would seemingly make no sense to most, as how would the storms be, well, behind the cold front? Wouldn't that make initiation harder? Well, that's because the storms did not originate along the front itself, but rather behind it. In order to get a clear picture of what went down on August 10th, I spoke with Nick Stewart, a meteorologist who worked for Iowa News Now when the derecho occurred. I asked him about what the atmosphere was like that morning, and a more in-depth picture of what the synoptics of the storm system looked like. So leading into August 10th, 2020, there were these constant days of potential of severe weather, potential of thunderstorms, pretty much every day. It was kind of your typical late summer pattern where you had a lot of heat, a lot of instability, you had a lot of moisture. The corn crop at that point in time is helping produce a lot of extra dew point value in the lowest levels of the atmosphere. So the atmosphere was kind of primed for severe weather every day. But we never really had a trigger to really get storms to go. And that pretty much changed on August 10th. We still had the instability in place. By noon in eastern Iowa, we're talking about Cape values or instability values approaching four to 5,000. And usually when you get these severe weather events, you have either high Cape, low shear, or low shear, high Cape. You kind of get one of the two. You really, it's very rare you get both high cape and high shear that's kind of what ended up unfolding on august 10th because in the upper levels of the atmosphere at about 500 millibar there's a pretty stout little short wave that was coming across northern iowa on top of instability around four to five thousand joules per kilogram of instability so the environment was very primed for severe weather the question is will there be a trigger well in this event the trigger was actually thunderstorms that were ongoing from the night before. We had this complex of thunderstorms that kind of was dancing across the Dakotas, South Dakota, and then by sunrise was moving into Sioux City, Iowa. And I remember going to sleep late the night before, around 3, 4 a.m., and those, these thunderstorms just didn't want to die. They just kept going and going, basically beyond anything what the weather models were showing. And I kind of knew that if these storms were to continue, there would be probably some problems in eastern Iowa. And so I set my alarm for like 11 a.m. the following morning, and I got woken up by my weather radio around 9 a.m. And I kind of knew right away that we were going to have a problem that afternoon, because at that point, I didn't need to look at radar. I pretty much knew those thunderstorms were thriving still, and they're moving into a very strongly sheared and strongly... Uh, in st uh, unstable environment. Like always, let's dig into numbers real quick. I want to bring up something new that I haven't mentioned before, though. That being the frontogenesis values from the 850 to 700 millibar levels over South Dakota and Nebraska around 6Z, when the storms were beginning to develop. Convective Chronicles mentioned this when he did a deep dive into this topic, but essentially, frontogenesis is a fancy term for the increase in the horizontal thermal gradient, or temperature gradient. Basically, where a frontal boundary could form. At 6Z, there was a bullseye right over the South Dakota-Nebraska border, coincidentally where the storms were. The shortwave trough's height falls also contributed to the initiation of the storms. Winds at the 850 millibar level were weak, with winds being at 10 to 20 knots. Winds at the 700 millibar level were 30 to 40 knots, with 500 millibar winds being from 40 to 50 knots. Deep layer shear around 11 a.m. in portions of Iowa were in excess of 40 knots, sufficient for storm organization. Instability was absurd. Surface base cape was over 2,500 joules per kilogram across a wide area from Nebraska through Indiana with a low-level cap in place that would erode during the day. Mixed layer cape ranged from 1,000 to 3,000 joules per kilogram throughout the morning, and then as high as 4,000 joules per kilogram during the afternoon hours. Mid-level lapse rates were from 7 to 8.5 degrees Celsius per kilometer, and low-level lapse rates around 6 to 7.5 degrees Celsius per kilometer according to the SBC website. However, rap soundings from Sioux City where the storms were elevated, had steep lapse rates from the 800 to 700 millibar level, maxing out at about 9 degrees Celsius per kilometer. 
The skewed T showed a stout inversion layer, indicating a layer of stable air near the surface. The stable air near the surface led to a larger hail threat in Nebraska and South Dakota, but that threat would diminish as the storm complex moved into Iowa and the layer of stable air would begin to erode as evidenced by rap soundings in Cedar Rapids, Davenport, and other locations. D-Cape, or Downdraft Cape, which shows the potential for damaging winds, was 1,600 to 1,700 joules per kilogram in Nebraska and Iowa ahead of the MCS. D-Cape continued to be high in Illinois and Indiana. Temperatures were in the low to upper 80s by the time the derecho moved into central and eastern Iowa, and dew points were in the upper 60s and into the 70s, aided by the corn sweat as Nick mentioned earlier. With modest low and deep layer shear ahead of the developing MCS, high instability values, the cap eroding throughout the day, and abundant moisture behind the cold front, the potential for a small MCS to explode in intensity was there. Progressive derechos are hard to forecast, and that was obvious given the early forecasts for the derecho from the SPC. Issuing a day 3 marginal risk, then a day 2 slight risk, being upgraded to a Day 1 Enhanced Risk in Illinois and Eastern Iowa at the 13Z Outlook. When the derecho began taking shape and moved through the Des Moines area, a Day 1 Moderate Risk was put in place in Iowa, Illinois, Wisconsin, and Indiana. But as early as 6Z, when a general thunderstorm risk was in place for portions of South Dakota and Nebraska, the storms were beginning to take off. At 2 a.m. Central, a thunderstorm near the Nebraska-South Dakota border formed, and over the next few hours, would grow into a thunderstorm complex moving to the east-southeast. Severe thunderstorm warnings began being issued for the developing complex around 2.45 a.m. These storms would continue to be severe warned throughout the morning. Due to the capping inversion near the surface, the main threat was large hail. The storms produced hail of 1-2 to two inches in diameter, and a small swath of 60 to 70 mile per hour wind gusts. As the storms approached Yankton, South Dakota, the Storm Prediction Center issued a severe thunderstorm watch at 6.05 a.m. for portions of South Dakota, Nebraska, and Iowa, with the primary threats being scattered damaging winds, with isolated wind gusts up to 75 miles per hour, and scattered large hail. Come 8 a.m., the storms were becoming more organized, with the leading thunderstorms already taking the all-so-familiar bow echo shape, signifying intense winds. The signs were clear, and something had to change fast in order to keep the storms at bay, but nothing was going to hold these storms back. With the increasing threat for widespread severe weather, the Storm Prediction Center issued a special 8 a.m. update issuing an enhanced risk for eastern Iowa and most of northern Illinois. At 8.55 a.m., the Storm Prediction Center issued another severe thunderstorm watch containing most of central Iowa, with the primary threat being severe straight-line winds, with a 70% chance of 10 or more severe wind events, and a 40% chance of one or more wind events in excess of 65 knots. The storms had already crossed over into Iowa, and had produced 60 to 70 mile per hour wind gusts along the Iowa Nebraska border. The sun began to rise, aiding in the increasing instability and warmer temperatures across the Midwest. In turn, the warming of the ground began to erode the surface cap, allowing for more wind gusts to begin reaching the ground. South of the main storms, some of the strong wind gusts became trapped underneath an inversion layer helping the wind gusts move rapidly to the south and southeast. Across far eastern Nebraska and western Iowa, strong wind gusts were being reported more than 50 miles away from the main line of storms. At 10 a.m., the storms were located to the east of Denison, but as the storms moved past the town, they were starting to intensify. A corridor of significant straight-line winds ranging from 80 to 100 miles per hour began to the east of the town, and continued towards Ames and the Des Moines metro area. Sheets of rain and heavy winds began battering those areas, beginning to produce damage to trees and power lines. 
but also to crops and structures. At 11.25 a.m., the Storm Prediction Center issued a particularly dangerous severe thunderstorm watch for eastern Iowa, northern Illinois, southern Wisconsin, northwestern Indiana, and southwestern Lake Michigan. The watch specified, with high confidence, the potential for damaging wind gusts of up to 100 miles per hour were likely. Five minutes later, the Storm Prediction Center issued a moderate risk for those same areas. The MCS was catching up to the cold front and was about to produce its strongest winds as a second swath of winds in excess of 100 miles per hour began to the northeast of Ames and swept through Marshalltown. Visibility was near zero, as those in Marshalltown came to their windows to see the winds battering their town that had gone through an EF3 tornado in 2018. The extreme winds near Marshalltown persisted as they approached the Cedar Rapids area, intensifying further as the rear inflow jets sped up on approach to the metro. A comma head feature was observed on radar, and wind gusts were beginning to exceed 120 miles per hour, beginning in Benton County, Iowa. Directly in the path was Cedar Rapids and Nick Stewart. As the storms approached Cedar Rapids, Nick got caught in the derecho and experienced the fury of the windstorm head on. I mean, where we were, right around that Keystone area in Benton County, Iowa, the post-event survey pretty much picked up as that air is being about the maximum of the winds, where the maximum core of upwards of 140 mile per wind started. And we felt that in our vehicle. So with the tornado, you can see it. It's pretty easy to get out of the way. The problem with the derecho is that you had this core of winds we now know are over 100 miles per hour, and it's, you know, 40 to 60 miles wide. I mean, it's just a bowling ball just moving down the area. It's very difficult difficult to get out of the way of that. So as we start trying to get out ahead of the storm, we know eventually it's going to run over us. We start keeping an eye on where to pull off. And so we're keeping an eye on where power lines are. We don't want power lines to fall on us. We're looking at where trees are. We don't want trees to fall on us. And so we kind of find this spot that's down a little bit of a hill. So it's got some reduction in wind just because we're down the hill a little bit. Way behind us, there's a tree line we thought would act as a bit of a windbreak. And we had no power lines that were in our immediate vicinity that would fall on us. So we decided that was probably going to be the best spot for us to basically ride it out. The only thing I would have done differently is point the vehicle into the wind. That is something we did not do at that point in time because visibility was so low. We didn't want to risk basically doing a U-turn on a major highway, which was Highway 30. So we decided to just leave the back facing the wind and I'm sitting in the back seat. So the wind gusts begin to increase and increase. And we have a weather station in our storm chasing vehicle that is measuring these wind gusts. And we start seeing 70 mile per hour winds, 80 mile per hour winds, and then they start pushing into 90. We measure 99 miles per hour on a roof mounted instrument when the back window blew out and showered me with glass. And at that point, you now have the rain that's pouring into the vehicle. I'm getting drenched by this thing. And that was really the first time that I really heard it. The sound was unlike any thunderstorm I've ever heard. I've been storm chasing for, you know, 12 years now. I've never heard a storm be as angry and violent as this. Just the whooshing and the whirring of the winds was unlike anything I've ever heard before. And in those weeks that followed, I was waking up in a cold sweat in nightmares. And like, I storm chase for fun. I, I love going out and seeing extreme weather. But now I'm having nightmares about a weather event that I went through. And to me, that was pretty hard. Uh, but I guess that's how I knew that this was kind of a one once in a lifetime kind of event. But the sounds were just horrendous. Um, just it's so hard to explain. I mean, imagine like Niagara Falls waterfall, that amount of just noise. Um, and the other thing that was happening during this time is that it was starting to get very cold. So we left, we had temperatures, you know, in the mid eighties. By the time the storm began 
began to wound down, we had air temperatures in the mid fifties in August in the, in, at like noon. So this storm, the intense downdrafts were basically pulling, you know, stratospheric temperatures down towards the surface. And we had this immense cold pool that developed and moved right through us. And so we had at one point, we also have pressure data in our vehicle and we measured a significant pressure drop uh, within a very short period of time. We believe it was from an MCV or mesoscale convective vortex basically forming kind of in that apex of the bow echo. And I think that's really what led to the intensity of the winds was a very tight area of low pressure uh, towards the middle of the storm. Um, but yeah, that was unlike anything I've ever experienced before. And I'll never forget when the wind started calming down, the visibility started getting better because in the thick of it, we had visibility. If you stick your arm out, I mean, you couldn't really see because the wind was blowing so hard. We finally got some better visibility, flipped the car around so that the windshield was facing into the wind. And I was able to kind of finally relax for a second. I'll never forget when I just finally put my hands on my face and it was very warm to the touch. And that's when I looked at my hands and realized I've been bleeding now for like 45 minutes because when the window blew out, it shattered, shattered me with glass, but I tried to use my rain jacket I was wearing to hold against the window, but all on the edge of the window frame, there were still shards of glass. And so I still have scars all over my hand uh, from trying to keep the, the rain out of the vehicle. Uh, but yeah, you know, usually these severe storms, they last five, 10 minutes and things calm down. We had intense wind gusts for at least 45 minutes. We had severe wind gusts for probably over an hour before things really began to settle down. It was unlike anything I've ever experienced. It was unlike anything I even knew was possible, quite frankly. Many across Lynn County watched in horror as shingles began ripping off of their homes. Trees uprooting from the ground and slamming into the streets. Power lines snapping and crashing onto the ground. Sheets of rain battering the city, creating low visibility. Transformers exploded left and right. It sounded like a riot was going on. But the riot in question was all Mother Nature's doing. But the wind gusts near 140 miles per hour were too much for the buildings in Cedar Rapids. Locals witnessed the roofs above their very heads and the walls of their homes being ripped off, exposing houses, apartment complexes, and other buildings to the extreme elements outside, as winds of at least 60 miles per hour would batter the city for the next hour, producing additional damage. But further in downtown, news stations, such as Iowa News Now, began evacuating their studio as the winds were so strong, their building began to shake. So I think it became pretty evident that serious problems were unfolding in Cedar Rapids. There was the precursor of me losing my window, and that's something that's never happened before. So, you know, they're going into the storm, moving into them after what just happened to me a few minutes prior. So you had that initial gust of wind that happened with kind of that leading gust front along the leading edge of the MCS. But what was so intense with this thunderstorm was more so that rear inflow jet as it began to ramp up with time. And I think the indication that problems were going to be unfolding in the studio is when the patio doors. So we have our chroma key wall right next to the chroma key wall is our weather patio. They can step out and do live weather on a patio. Well, there are doors there that basically blew in from the wind. And you can faintly hear it in coverage. In our coverage, you can hear the doors get blown open. And they looked outside. And after talking to them, you know, similar recollection from my end when I experienced it not too long ago, prior to that, was it was so dark outside. I mean, you're talking 1230, bright daylight, and it was incredibly dark outside. And then you hear the wind, the howling of the wind, the roar of the wind. And slowly but surely, the winds continue to kind of increase in intensity. And you can see all the lights. They kind of began to sway. And at one point, 
watching the coverage after the fact, they took a camera that was mounted on the ceiling that looks down in the studio, and it was shaking and showing how much was shaking. The whole building at that point in time was shaking. And so they decided because of the doors blowing in, the lights hanging, I mean, we're talking very heavy lights that if something were to happen, they could fall on you. You don't want to be anywhere around that. So they made the decision to evacuate the studio just because kind of similar for tornado precautions. You don't want to be in, say, a basketball arena. You don't want to be in a gymnasium, those big, expansive rooms. That's kind of what our studio is like. Those are not very well secure places to be. So they decided to take the coverage into our interior hallways. And while they were doing so, they were telling the viewers, we're leaving. That should be a pretty big indication that you should be doing the same thing. Take shelter in your home um, as this was evolving. And things were just slowly ramping up. And the other issue with our building is that we have a 600 foot tower that stands above us. It's our one of our main communication towers for our TV station. The tower itself is rated for 100 mile per hour winds. With this storm moving in, they were estimating, you know, 120, 130, 140. So this tower was under immense strain. And engineers were looking up. There's a window where you can look straight up at the tower. And they were watching that 600 foot tower swaying. And the way those towers are designed, uh, if they were to fail, they don't fall one way, they don't fall the other way. They're designed to come straight down to limit collateral damage around the building. And so that would have meant that tower would have come straight down on the TV studio. And that obviously would have been a significant problem. What likely saved the tower was that back in 2007, there was a major ice storm in Cedar Rapids. And when they were doing repairs to that tower, the contractor suggested they add a fourth set of guy wires to the tower. And after some discussion, they finally agreed to do it. And it was likely that fourth set of guy wires that kept that tower from collapsing on our studio. Because it was at the brink. And there were other towers in the area that did come down uh, because of those really intense winds. As the windstorm rushed towards the Quad Cities region, the wind gusts diminished slightly to roughly 80 to 100 miles per hour. However, the wind gusts continued to damage infrastructure and crops. Wind gusts estimated to be around 130 miles per hour near Clinton, Iowa, caused a radio transmission tower to collapse. Wind gusts began to diminish after 2 p.m. once the derecho crossed over the Mississippi River into northern Illinois. Gusts of 100 to 110 miles per hour were estimated in a small area near Princeton, Illinois, and in a separate instance near Forreston, Illinois. Gusts of over 90 miles per hour were recorded in central Illinois, causing semis along I-80 to be overturned. Just to the south, multiple multi-cell clusters of thunderstorms began congealing into a secondary line of storms separate from the derecho. At 2.55 p.m., a severe thunderstorm watch was issued for portions of Illinois and Missouri for the second line of storms. Around 3 p.m., the threat for tornadoes increased. A storm ahead of the line produced two tornadoes near the Rockford area. Numerous additional tornadoes formed along the line of storms, impacting areas in Illinois near Kirkland, Marengo, Elburn, and Ottawa. One tornado touched down near Yorkville and tracked for almost 15 miles near Plainfield. Thankfully, the tornadoes themselves were relatively weak, with the strongest tornadoes being rated EF1. On approach to Chicago, wind gusts ranging from 60 to 80 miles per hour continued. At 3.25 p.m., another severe thunderstorm watch was issued, this time for northern and central Indiana, southwestern Michigan, far northwestern Ohio, and southeastern Lake Michigan. Around 4 p.m., the storms reached the Chicago metro area, producing a narrow corridor of 80 to 100 mile per hour wind gusts on the northern side of the city, alongside a brief EF-1 tornado. The strong winds, in combination with the rapid changes in pressure across the southern portion of Lake Michigan, 
pushed water levels substantially higher for a brief period along the southeast shore. By the time the derecho crossed over into Indiana, the storm system began to weaken drastically. Meteorologists already knew the storm's intensity had already peaked, but the weakening trend was more drastic after it moved through Chicago. The radar appearance was not as strong as it was earlier in the day, and the estimated wind gusts of the storms were weaker, with the last streak of wind gusts of at least 70 miles per hour being recorded to the south of Gary, Indiana. Damage coming out of the rest of northern and central Indiana was limited to trees and power lines, although a few instances of structural damage was reported. At 6.30 p.m., a severe thunderstorm watch was issued for portions of Illinois, Indiana, Kentucky, and Missouri for the second line of storms. Straight-line wind damage became more scattered as the storms approached Ohio. The final severe thunderstorm watch for the event was issued at 7.05 p.m. for portions of Kentucky, Indiana, Ohio, and Lake Erie. Once the storms moved properly into Ohio, the wind gusts diminished below severe limits and were no longer producing significant damage. Both the storms associated with the derecho and the secondary line of storms began to weaken and dissipate during the nighttime hours, ending the severe threat for the day. But for those across the Midwest, they were now trying to make some sort of sense of what just happened. Before jumping into the area that was impacted the worst, mainly the Cedar Rapids area, I want to quickly go over everywhere else. All across where the derecho passed, the winds terrorized the landscape, ripping trees from the ground, tearing down power lines, flattening crops, and destroying out buildings and grain bins. The true horrors of the damage began with the first swath of 100 mile per hour wind gusts. In the more densely populated areas near Ames and Des Moines, trees were pushed onto homes, and power lines lay dead on the streets. A lawn chair was stuck in a wall in Ames. The chair picked up by the winds and slammed into the wall. A hog confinement building was demolished in Tama County. In Woodward, Iowa, one of the exterior walls of a building collapsed. Marshalltown, a city that suffered from an EF3 tornado just a few years prior, was now in the wake of a windstorm like no other. The mayor, Moe Greer, declared a civil emergency as widespread property damage was reported across the city. People were trapped in their cars by trees and down power lines, and more than 50 gas leak reports were filed in the city. The WMT Tower north of Marion, Iowa snapped. Trees snapped at the base just outside of the NWS Davenport office. A gaping hole was left in the outside wall of a home in Eli. An outbuilding was completely demolished in Donahue, and near Vinton, a grain bin was crushed and thrown into the side of a house. The church steeple at a church in Wheaton, Illinois, was toppled over onto the roof of the building. Garages and outhouses across the Chicago metro collapsed, with trees littering the streets. Interstates across the Midwest were blocked and severe wind damage continued to be observed into Indiana. The derecho's impacts to power and agriculture were widespread. A total of 1.5 million people lost power, with the power outages across the states of Iowa and Illinois lasting for as long as weeks. The damage to agriculture was nothing like the Midwest had experienced before, especially in the state of Iowa. An estimated 10 million acres of crops across Iowa, a third of all cropland in the state, was damaged. Of those 10 million acres, 3.5 to 4 million acres of corn were severely damaged or destroyed. Farmers walked out in horror to see the once tall fields of cornstalk flattened down like a bulldozer just ran over the fields. The damage was so extreme and so widespread that it was captured on satellite. For farmers, their worst nightmare was right in front of them. The corn was supposed to be collected five to six weeks from then, and the yields were initially expected to average 202 bushels of corn per acre. That estimation was now expected to be 100 to 150 bushels per acre. 
The next two weeks, farmers had to determine whether to salvage the corn for feed for animals, or determine if the crop was healthy enough to harvest for grain. The farmers were already hurt by the supply shortages during the COVID-19 pandemic. The aftermath of the derecho only made the pain worse. To add insult to injury, the storm damaged or destroyed more than 100 million bushels of grain storage, which could not be rebuilt in time for harvest. The silver lining was that there was still some hope that the soybean crop would still be able to survive, and that 90% of farmers in Iowa had crop insurance. But as one farmer put it, I know some people won't survive this. But even the damage in the agriculture field was nothing compared to what the second largest city of Iowa had been through. The Cedar Rapids metro area suffered from the worst of the storm. The realization of how horrific the storm's impacts were in Lynn County became crystal clear to Nick Stewart as he made his way back to Cedar Rapids. So we were out in kind of rural portions of Benton County, and once things finally began to settle down, uh, the winds really began to calm down, we were kind of assessing our damage in our vehicle, kind of looking around us as well. We could see that the cornfield that was next to us was just obliterated. I mean, it was just flat, flat, flat. I've never seen a cornfield decimated quite like that. Now, I've seen a lot of cornfields take damage from storms, but usually, you know, there are still a few stalks that are standing here and there, and they're not fully horizontal with the ground, but they're kind of at like some angle. But this corn was just broken at the base flat. I've never seen that before. And we started kind of looking around, and behind us, there was a house. And you could tell that all the siding was ripped off. There were shingles missing. There's a tree on it. So we go over to this house and we go check on them to make sure they're okay. And they were, they were taking shelter from the storm. They were actually watching us on TV and they watched us pull up outside their house and they were like, eh. so we made sure they were okay. And, you know, we were shooting video of this damage thinking, wow, this is crazy damage. And then we would drive back to Cedar Rapids. Cause at this point we're like, all right, we probably should get back to home base. And we're kind of out of communication at this point in time because cell phone towers were significantly impacted. We really didn't know the severity of things ongoing off to our east. So we're driving down the road and we came across, you know, all these high tension power lines just flattened. And it was like, wow, the force it took to do that. So we stop, we park, we get all the camera stuff out. We shoot some video, the power lines down, pack it all back in. We drive like another quarter mile and wow there's this barn that's destroyed we get out and you know we've done this now like three or four times and it was starting to kind of click to me of wow this isn't really localized you know usually when you have these high-end severe weather events they're usually kind of hyper localized the damage but as we're driving farther and farther and farther 10 15 20 miles there's damage everywhere everywhere that you see and it became painfully apparent to us that this was very widespread, very high-end damage. And so we're tr still trying to get to Cedar Rapids at this point in time. And there is another set of high-tension power lines blocking the highway, so low that cars can't get underneath efficiently, and semis are blocking as well. So we're kind of stuck in traffic, and myself and my photojournalist um jason meyer we're sitting there trying to figure out well what should we do here at that point in time i get a sliver of cell phone service and my now fiance calls me and she was like hey just letting you know i'm okay but we lost the roof of our apartment and that was kind of my first indication of okay cedar rapids took a hit and so at that point in time, she's like, she was still in shelter. She didn't leave the apartment complex, but okay. So now we know there's all this damage around us off to the West. We now know that a roof is blown off of my apartment complex in Cedar Rapids. Am I just that unlucky or was this very widespread? So we continue to drive closer and closer. We get underneath these power lines. Uh, Jason did a masterful job of navigating around some ditches to get underneath these power lines and we're going. So I'll never forget, it's on the far southwest side of Cedar Rapids. It's where Highway 100 and Highway 30 meet. And there's a pretty big neighborhood right there. And there's a big sign that says, you know, exit here for Cedar Rapids. And that sign is just blown down. It's one of those massive interstate highway signs. 
and it's just blown down. And I'm thinking to myself, just the ferocity of the winds at have to have been insane. And we take this ramp to get onto Highway 100. And as we're driving up, we can have a clear overlook of this neighborhood. And you can tell every single house had shingles missing. You can see like the wood of the roofing material on basically every single house. And then I was like, wow, like you can see all these houses. I didn't really put two and two together yet that, oh, wait, all the trees that are normally blocking the view of these houses are gone. And it became painfully apparent that the tree canopy was decimated. And so we're still trying to get into Cedar Rapids. We're coming out of the Northwest side and just trees down, trees down, highway signs down. And we finally get into Cedar Rapids itself and it's gridlock traffic because all of the power is out. Not only are you, you're not getting those blinking red lights, the red lights, if they're even still on the pole are just out. We had these, you know, massive street lights that are just missing off of all of these poles. And so we start trying to get to the station. We're navigating around all these down trees. We passed by multiple houses where the roofs were just completely blown off. And, you know, it, it, it was just unlike anything I've ever seen before, just how widespread it was, how high end it was, because I'm so used to covering tornado damage. You know, I've been in many, many neighborhoods and many towns that were hit by tornadoes. And it's usually, you know, like a block or two of damage and then everything is fine on either side. But everywhere we went, there was damage. And we were trying to cover the storm after the fact. So once I got back to the studios, probably at that point in time, I'd say maybe three o'clock in the afternoon, we're trying to assess how are we going to cover the storm for our five o'clock, our six o'clock, our nine o'clock and 10 o'clock newscasts, while also knowing that my house is just destroyed, apparently. I haven't seen it yet. So we start trying to send reporters out to cover various areas, but they couldn't really get around very well. And so we really didn't understand the scope of the damage in town for days because there were parts of town that we weren't able to get to for three or four days. And so just, it really took a while, really, I think for it to set in that this was just unlike anything we've ever seen before. Iowa is still just beginning to recover from one of the worst windstorms to hit the state and several others in the Midwest. Slamming the Cedar Rapids area with destruction reminiscent of a hurricane, killing at least four people. Well, our hearts grieve for all of the families who have been impacted by the derecho that passed through Iowa and through the Midwest. For those who had just gone through the derecho in Lynn County, the damage was indescribable. Many were left in shock as they went outside to see the true horrors that the storms left behind. Cedar Rapids is no stranger to significant natural disasters, such as the flood of 08. But the 2020 derecho was worse in every single way. One National Guard commander compared what he saw to the damage he saw during the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. Although that comparison is a bit hyperbolic in retrospect, in the moment, that's what it felt like. The damage was worse than what many had experienced before that point. According to Iowa's starting line, there was no way to fully describe the full extent of the damage. Descriptors, such as calling the damage the result of a land hurricane, a bomb, an apocalypse, a 40-mile-wide tornado, an artillery barrage, would not come close to the words that could aptly describe what happened in Cedar Rapids. Unless people saw it in person, it was impossible to fully visualize. Massive trees uprooted to a point of where it took a part of someone's yard in the street with it. That wasn't an isolated incident. That was literally once every few blocks. Every power line was tangled. Every tree blasted. 
every house damaged. Every street covered in branches or downed trees or smashed cars trapped under them. A thin, white dusting covered the sides of almost every building. The source? Insulation from blown up roofs that spread across the city. Piles of downed tree limbs were as high as six feet on both sides of the road for the entire length of every block. These descriptions are verbatim from the article by Iowa Starting Line. Parks across the city were closed until the end of the year, with the exception of the Palisades Kepler State Park, which was closed until 2021. 65% of the tree canopy was destroyed in Cedar Rapids. More than 1,000 housing units were deemed unlivable. A city curfew was put in place until August 24th. Grocery stores were utter chaos. Gas station lines spanned for hours. Gas leaks were widespread. Food spoiled due to the loss of power. Cell service was nearly non-existent after the cell tower's generators went out. Bricks and glass littered the streets. COVID testing sites were damaged, and schools had to delay reopening. It was like a war zone. Everyone was in shock, and they all just needed help. The entire city was devastated. It wasn't localized. It was a complete and utter disaster. The damage was the worst the city had ever seen, and the images do not do it justice. Nick Stewart was one of those who came home to see what happened to where he lived that evening. And I finally, you know, get to my apartment. My apartment roof is gone. Um, the other problem is when the roof ripped off, all those really nice fire suppression lines that are there to save you in case of a fire, well, they all ruptured and were just pouring water on everything that I owned. So that was super cool. Um, so we packed a few things that I could get out of the apartment and we go to my friend's house. And he also, of course, didn't have power. The whole city didn't have power. It was late at night. You know, after sunset, and the whole, it's just pitch, pitch black everywhere that you look. And I'll never forget another thing that I'll never forget. I mean, the whole day is unforgettable. We're sitting out there at night. It's like 11 o'clock at night. And I just look up, and you can just see the whole arm of the Milky Way. I've never seen the night sky that dark, especially in a Cedar Rapids metro area. Um, it just really showed just how much power loss there was across the whole region so that that first day was it was a learning you know every hour you'd learn something new something else was damaged some other neighborhood was damaged but the stories these people had and the effects on everyday citizens truly illustrated the humanitarian crisis that had unfolded hospitals were running on backup power a serious problem for those in the hospital, regardless of what time of year it was. But looking at the year that this event took place, the problem was much, much worse. Hospitals nationwide were already understaffed and near full capacity due to the COVID-19 pandemic. People were on ventilators and were struggling to survive the mysterious virus that came from halfway across the world. Not only were the hospitals doing their damnedest to help those who were fighting COVID, but now they had to monitor the status of the generators and move patients and equipment away from the areas of the hospitals that suffered damages from the derecho. The staff were already overwhelmed, but the hospitals were now desperately helping the numerous wounded residents that arrived on mattresses in the back of flatbed trucks. Firefighters were jumping out of fire trucks and into people's cars to bring patients in. Nursing home patients were transported to other sister facilities, such as the case with the Crestview Acres Nursing Home, where the entrance was completely unusable. People left the city and went to hotels if they could afford it. Derecho refugees packed every sold-out hotel from Iowa City to Waterloo. A medicine crisis was unfolding as people had to throw out their insulin and start rationing it as the medicine, usually required to be refrigerated, was going bad due to the lack of power. The communities that saw the worst of the aftermath were the disabled, refugees, and those in low-income neighborhoods and housing. 
adults with disabilities, such as Stephen Carney, were stuck in their rooms. Stuck on the second floor of his apartment built for adults with disabilities. With no power, the elevator was not working. Then, there were the city's refugees. The refugee population contains people hailing from Central and Eastern Africa and the Pacific Island nations. Many fled to the United States to escape persecution, extreme poverty, or environmental devastation. The dwellings in Cedar Rapids were the only homes they had. After the storm, those refugees, whose homes were now unlivable, were now living in their cars or tents for multiple days after the event. One Afghanistan veteran mentioned to Iowa starting line that his utterly destroyed home reminds him of the war-torn cities he once toured. Families were packed in their cars, driving around the city to scavenge for food and supplies. The majority of those families did not have access to the internet or have their phones charged, so they couldn't even search online where the aid was being distributed. Locals in low-income neighborhoods were outside on porches and grilled what they could because of the lack of refrigeration and ice. People who could only buy groceries twice a month lost everything they had. Residents such as James Jones were frustrated at the lack of aid coming to low-income neighborhoods such as his own. Over on A Avenue and C Avenue, their lights are on, said James Jones. Up the street, above 20th Street, their lights are on. But over here, 3rd Avenue, 2nd Avenue, 4th Avenue, 5th Avenue, their lights aren't on. Further down the street from where James Jones was were friends Tank and Dookie Berry. Tank said that trucks from Aliens Energy go straight through the area, going straight across 19th. The upper class, the middle class, and then, I guess, we're like no class at all, added Barry. We get our stuff done last. We're cleaning up our stuff ourselves. They then pointed out to the trees they cleaned up and the light pole they dragged out of the street. Residents across Lynn County were fed up by the end of the week by the lack of aid and news coming from governmental agencies, but also from the media. Local journalists from local TV stations to Iowa Starting Line to newspapers such as the Gazette, the Daily Iowan, the Des Moines Register, and Times Republican worked diligently to report on what was happening across the Cedar Rapids area and the state of Iowa. However, many felt ignored by the mass media. A columnist for the Gazette wrote in a Washington Post editorial that more attention was brought to Hurricane Isaias than what happened in Iowa. What else got more coverage from the media? The pandemic, the 2020 election, college football, and for more conservative outlets, Cardi B's new song. Sure, web articles were published and maybe a brief mention on the nightly or morning news, but a vast majority of the reporters were nowhere close to the epicenter of the disaster. When reporters went out to Iowa, such as in the case of CBS News, it had already been at least a week since the derecho occurred. The lack of coverage made many across Iowa feel like they were left out, ignored when they needed the attention brought to them the most so they could get additional help. Some of those news stations cited COVID concerns, but apparently those weren't realized when those national outlets sent out reporters for Hurricane Hannah, Isaias, Laura, Sally, Delta, Zeta, but there were a few exceptions to the lack of coverage. In the world of written media, the Washington Post's Capital Weather Gang wrote multiple articles about the derecho. However, the one media outlet that was in Iowa and constantly talking about the derecho after the fact was the Weather Channel. They were the only major media outlet who was on the ground there in Iowa, according to Nick Stewart. I would say in those first few days, you know, once you got past the initial shock, it became, you know, a humanitarian crisis. You know, you had hot temperatures, you had no power, you had no gas, gas was hard to come by. And I think people just started to get kind of, you know, rightfully so angry and upset and you know you're dealing with this incredible situation and they needed something or somebody to take their anger out on or their shock and just awe on on they needed some target essentially 
um, the national media really didn't cover this at all. Huge, huge shout out to the Weather Channel. They were the only national outlet that not only covered it well, but they were boots on the ground covering it every day for a long time. Um, I am forever grateful for the Weather Channel for the work that they did during the derecho because I think they were our best chance of getting the word out. Justin Michaels, he is one of my favorite people at the Weather Channel. Never met him, never talked to him. He's one of my favorite people there, though, um, just because of the work and commitment that he did covering the derecho event. The national coverage, it was so lacking. You know, I remember we were reaching out to um, meteorologist Rebecca Colfin on the morning was reaching out to Ginger Z over at ABC. Like, can you come cover this? Like, this is a major thing that's unfolded. And ABC wasn't sending people out because of COVID. Then they sent people out for hurricane coverage later in the year. But again, I'll get off my soapbox on that. Um, but again, there was just a lot of there was a lot, a lack of coverage of it. I think in part because it was Iowa. You know, we are flyover country. That's what most people like to refer to us as. And I think again, because it wasn't, you know, this sexy tornado, this big mile wide tornado. And also, we didn't have a lot of fatalities. You know, we had three, uh, four if you count one that happened after the storm. We had four total fatalities from the derecho. But you know, I mean. Was that a, apparently that wasn't enough for the national media to really kind of focus on? And there's other things going on. Obviously, the pandemic in 2020 remained, you know, a talking point the entire year. So there were other major stories that were unfolding, you know, and I was in my own little bubble in Cedar Rapids because I had no cell phone service and I had no internet. I had no idea what was happening in the United States or the world, you know, while we were dealing with our own crisis. And I was focusing on our own crisis and nothing else. So I think there was a lot of, you know, what about us? And I think that was, I think a lot of people were rubbed the wrong way by that just because we didn't quite get that coverage. I mean, even like the floods of 08, you know, got a lot of national attention. You know, we had CBS Morning Show, CBS This Morning Live, the Today Show was live, and all these major news agencies were live during the flood of 08, but then didn't do anything really with the, the derecho show in 2020. So I, I think a lot of people felt like, you know, does anybody even care about us? And the other thing, too, is, you know, we needed help. We had a lot of people that lost everything. We were without power for up to two weeks in some places. People needed food and water. There were very vulnerable parts of the city that were so heavily impacted. Some of the hardest hit areas in the city were immigrants that were, you know, on lower income. And their apartment complexes were just destroyed. And they had nowhere to go. They were living in tents for weeks. And it was becoming kind of a humanitarian issue. And we just didn't get that coverage. And I think a lot of people were up mad about it. And clearly, I may be a little slighted about that as well. Except the Weather Channel. Again, big shout out to the Weather Channel for, I think, covering it properly. The governmental response was a mess. With many justifyingly frustrated that it took so long for the response to get going. But first, a quick timeline of events. On the 13th, Mike Pence held two campaign rallies in Iowa. He talked with farmers about what they experienced and pledged that the federal government would help rebuild. Also on the 13th, Mayor Brad Hart said in the immediate aftermath of the derecho that city manager Jeff Pomeranz didn't think support from the National Guard was necessary. The National Guard begins to get requests for help from Lynn County. On the 14th, Reynolds arrived in Cedar Rapids with 100 National Guard troops. And Governor Reynolds says that it's up to local officials to request disaster assistance. Hate to be that guy, but how exactly were they going to request disaster assistance with no power and gee, where have we seen this back and forth between the governor, local, and federal officials before? At this point, Reynolds and Senators Charles Grassley and Jody Ernst have toured some of the damage focusing on crop damage, but have remained silent when it came to demanding national help. The next day, Finkanar visited Marshalltown, and a federal disaster declaration was still not issued. On the 16th, Governor Reynolds formally requested a federal disaster declaration for nearly $4 billion in aid for 27 counties. The next day, President Trump announced that he had partially approved the request. 
but did not approve the individual assistance program. 16 of the 27 counties had the request denied, as FEMA believed there was not enough damage. On the 17th, FEMA Administrator Pete Gaynor traveled to Iowa to meet with Governor Reynolds. On the 18th, Trump arrived in Cedar Rapids and joined a private meeting with Senators Grassley and Ernst and Cedar Rapids Mayor Brad Hart. At the meeting, Hart begged Trump to approve the individual assistance program. Trump left Cedar Rapids the same day and did not interact with the public or tour the damage, leaving residents mixed about his visit. On the 19th, Iowa's Secretary of Agriculture, Mike Nag, met with farmers in Marion to address their concerns, and Senator Ernst toured the damage in Marshalltown. On the 20th, an individual disaster declaration was approved for Lynn County. On September 1st, the Governor's Office announced the addition of 10 counties approved for FEMA individual assistance aid. On September 3rd, U.S. Secretary of Agriculture, Sony Perdue, declared natural disasters in 18 counties, opening up aid for farmers. On the 11th, it was announced that FEMA added seven counties to its original disaster declaration, with a separate declaration for the Sac and Fox tribes of the Mississippi and Iowa. To many in the Cedar Rapids area, and in places such as Marion, the response from the government was too slow. Given the number of power outages, in hindsight, Waiting for a request just seemed nonsensical, considering how large the scope of the damage was. A federal disaster declaration should have been issued sooner rather than later, if to bring attention to the situation more than anything. But there was some good that came to Iowa during the aftermath of the event. Just like almost every natural disaster, communities, businesses, and individuals came together to help and support the people of Iowa. Nonprofits and charity organizations were instrumental with easing the pain. The Salvation Army partnered with Tyson Foods to hand out free, frozen chicken breasts, and the Salvation Army continued to help those affected by the derecho. Operation Barbecue Relief prepared around 8,000 meals to hand out at distribution sites around the Cedar Rapids area with director Mike Richter saying, if we could make it go away, we would. But if we can give them a meal that for a minute that hot, a hot barbecue meal that takes their mind away for a little, God bless you. We're sorry what you're dealing with. Cedar Valley Black Lives Matter drove down and set up tables in front of Stay Sharp Barbershop, giving away gas cans, flashlights, candles, charcoal, lighter fluid, pampers, and more. They returned to the city with trucks and chainsaws to help remove debris. Businesses such as Iowa Storm Restoration pitched in to help. The owners, Jeff Rodnicki and Kent Fisher, set up a tent outside their store on the south side of Marion, providing donations of charcoal, gas, food, and other supplies to those who drove up. City resource centers across Cedar Rapids were giving food, water, and other toiletries to a constant line of cars. But the most support came from the individuals in and out of the city. Representative Finkenar did her civic duty as a congresswoman and hosted a relief drive at her office in southeast Cedar Rapids, handing out food, water, flashlights, toilet paper, diapers, and more. So many people stopped by that they ran out of food for the grill in the first hour. Theresa Greenfield, a Democrat running for the Senate that year, handed out water bottles in traffic and served meals in Cedar Rapids to residents who lived in a low-income neighborhood. Small groups of individuals set up tables of free goods in small parks. Tony Boardman, Cindy Middleton, and Caroline Rossacker traveled from Guttenberg to Marion to help. Rossacker stated that she couldn't sit in her comfortable home in her beautiful community when two hours away, her neighbors and her brothers are suffering. The power of individuals coming to help a community of such size was awe-inspiring to those who found out about what people did for each other. While the pain the people felt did not go away, the actions by nonprofits, businesses, 
and individuals helped to at least numb the pain temporarily. Months would go by as the city continued to clean up and rebuild. Today, some areas affected by the derecho are lively once more, just like they were before the derecho hit. However, the recovery effort is far from over, even three years later. The damage to the landscape across Iowa, spanning from areas east of Denison to areas along the Illinois border, is still visible. Some areas have not been rebuilt or been able to fully recover. Yet, the strength of the Iowan populace overcame what Mother Nature had in store. The residents, especially in Cedar Rapids, hoped to never see what they saw on August 10th again. Then July 28th, 2023 happened. It was like a relapse of the worst nightmare Lynn County had seen. 100 mile per hour wind gusts battered the city of Cedar Rapids and the surrounding area. Flashbacks to what occurred nearly three years prior were racing in many people's minds. Thankfully, the damage was nowhere near as bad, likely because a lot of the trees that would have collapsed did so in 2020. However, the relapsing memories so close to the three-year anniversary date, August 10th, was present that July night. Now, it's about time to come to the conclusion of the tale of the August 10th derecho. Three years ago, many awoke in the Midwest expecting another hot summer day. But instead, what they got was a severe weather event that could never be forgotten. A derecho with wind gusts as high as 140 miles per hour, wreaked havoc across the Hawkeye State, with the derecho, while weaker, still producing damage in Illinois, Wisconsin, Indiana, Michigan, and far western Ohio. Across those states, trees were ripped apart, homes were damaged, and power lines lied on the ground. However, in the state of Iowa, the effects were much more extreme. Grain bins were utterly destroyed, silos were deformed, fields upon fields of corn were flattened, buildings were missing walls and roofs, and the people in the path were suffering in the aftermath of the event, with numerous people being injured during and after the storm. However, despite the mind-boggling amounts of damage the derecho caused, the event is not even closely remembered outside of those who are in the weather community, and the state of Iowa. More attention was brought to less notable storms from that year than what happened in Iowa. In terms of journalism, from the majority of the media, it was an utter failure. Yet, local news outlets and the Weather Channel stood their ground and did their jobs, getting stories and reporting on the crisis that was ongoing. The response from the government was messy, and longer than it should have been. That much is certain. In total, the derecho produced damaging wind gusts over an area of at least 90,000 square miles. The peak estimated winds, around 140 miles per hour, were among the highest known to ever have occurred in a derecho. 26 tornadoes touched down, with the strongest being an EF-1. The derecho killed four and caused $11.2 billion in damages making the August 2020 Midwest derecho the costliest severe thunderstorm event in the United States, and the second costliest natural disaster that year, with the only storm beating it being Hurricane Laura. Three years later, the wounds may still exist for those across Iowa, and especially in areas such as Marshalltown and the Cedar Rapids Metro. Those wounds have been able to heal at least somewhat, and the communities who were hit have been able to move on stronger than before. The August 2020 Midwest derecho is an event that those in Iowa and Illinois will not forget. And it's an event I will not forget anytime soon. So, I want to start off by giving a big shout out to Iowa Starting Line, the Gazette, the Des Moines Register, the Daily Iowan, and Times Republican for their standout coverage of this event. Their articles and reporting on the aftermath were some of the best examples of journalism I've read, and I seriously cannot understate how much I respect them. Special thanks to Dick Stewart for agreeing to an interview despite all of the technical issues because I hate my internet speech right now, and Convective Chronicles for helping me out by simply making his video on the 2020 derecho from a purely meteorological perspective. Go check his video out, link to that is in the description. Thanks to my proofreaders, those being Neptune and Convective Chronicles. 
Convective Chronicles specifically helped me with the synopsis and helped me understand Mixlayer Cape correctly. Additional special thanks to Celtic White for the character stills I use, Zinnel, Cyanide Blue, and Crackalek for letting me use their music whenever I use it, and everyone for watching. It means a lot. I want to give specific thanks to some of my fans who let me use their footage from the event, those being What Why 1011 Matt Alfrey, Jessica Van Camp, Logan Cruz, and Alex Hart. Alongside those who gave me permission for using their footage they already have up on YouTube, such as Brandon and Irving B. Felspar. If anyone has any footage for my next project, which is Hurricane Florence, and you don't mind me using your footage, you can send it to my burner email, which is listed on screen right now. Special thanks to those subscribed to the channel Patreon or are a YouTube member. Those being Ace Cooper, Ambiguity, Montpellier, Tanner Leper, That Dude, and Von Goros at the Elfie's Army tier, Heldrick Zero and Tennille's Weather Marine Space Station at the Elf Junior tier, and Basilius of Stupidonia, Dante DMC, Epix, Hannah Stormer, J. Cario, King Shisha, Liz Swaff, Neon Binary, Sandra Dunn West, Talkboy, Van Granny, and Worm Off the String at the Elf Mini tier. If you want to have access to full uncut interviews, my scripts, and my notes, alongside other things in the future, consider subscribing to the Patreon or becoming a YouTube member. It helps me financially and will allow me to do in-person interviews in the future, hopefully. Anyways, that covers everything. If you enjoy what I do, consider liking, subscribing to the channel, commenting your thoughts, and sharing it around. I'm Alfaria, you all stay safe out there, and I'll see you all soon.